This brief presentation provides a big picture overview of instructional design. The main purpose of this presentation is to help you learn how to describe the major components of instructional design and also identify where these components fit into the application of design thinking in general and more specifically in educational practice. Now, if you've done some of the readings from week one for this course, you know that one of the big pictures for, for design thinking is represented here on the screen, and that is um, phases where you empathize with the, the situation, you define possible solutions to identified problems, you ideate or, or consider solutions or multiple solutions, alternate solutions, develop a prototype, and then you test it out. It's, it's a process of thinking more than a process of being faced with a problem and then just doing what you think is initially the best way to address the problem, whether it's uh, just based on a traditional approach to, approach to addressing the problem or whether it's just based on your own perhaps limited experiences. And one of the reasons why this is such a good thing for educators to consider is that I believe too many instructional problems are, are solved by educators using either what has been a traditional approach to solving a problem like that or an approach that you that educators draw upon based on their limited experiences with those kinds of instructional problems. Now, in in the initial week, you were asked to reflect on the relationship between design thinking and instructional design. And what we see here um, on the screen is a representation of one of the classic basic fundamental frameworks for instructional design. And these are the main components um, with the acronym ADDIE that, that are part of the instructional design process. Now the course text that we are using presents those same five ADDIE components in a, in a slightly different representation um, because it, it, it presents some of the sort of subcomponents. For example, conducting an instructional analysis in the, uh, in the model that's presented in the text is a characteristic of the, design, of the analyzed component. And a subcomponent of instructional analysis leads to writing performance objectives, which is part of the design process, but it is a direct response to the instructional analysis. So you can see in their model, the Dick Carey and Carey model, that there is a, um, uh, th there, are, there are more steps because it fleshes out more specifically some of the distinct components of the design process. Now, you were asked in, in last week to consider how the design thinking model, like you see on the top, um, how it's the same or different from typical instructional design models. And you, you were provided with an article well, articles about both of these different models. And after reviewing some of the responses from students in class, I'm glad to, it's, I'm glad to see that many of you realized some of the fundamental similarities between these two approaches. So the empathize phase of design thinking is part of the analysis phase in instructional design. And so is defining the, the problem or defining the, the situation, as it were. That's all part of analyzing the situation. In design thinking, the ideation phase is very similar to the design phase in instructional design, where you, you consider alternate approaches, um, you consider um, brainstorming techniques and other ways to to try and figure out if you know what the problem is what are some possible solutions one thing about instructional design though that might be different from design thinking is that there are a lot of very distinct recommendations 
almost algorithms about what types of things should go into the design based on what type of problem you identify. And so in that way, instructional design might be a little more precise than design thinking. Design thinking has the phase prototyping where you create a, um, a possible solution based on resources at hand. And that's part of, that's analogous to the development process in, the in, in instructional design. And then the test phase of design thinking um, is very analogous to the implementation phase of, of instructional design. And certainly in both cases, um, design thinking as well as instructional design, the idea of evaluating is part of reflecting and testing and examining feedback and making changes as you go along. Now, um, one of the things that I want to point out is that in the course notes and in my subsequent lectures to this intro orientation lecture, I am going to present you with a slightly modified model of instructional design that deviates from the book a little bit. The book follows the Addy design fairly, fairly well, but the model that I am going to, to present to you adds an important missing step, in my opinion, between the first two phases of the design process. Actually, it's a step that's missing in the first phase in analyze, but it carries its way into the design phase. And so that's why in the big picture and in the course notes, I call it going from Addy to a Caddy, because I'm adding a, a, a C context in the middle of, and then an additional, an additional um, analysis phase. And so I present a, a model that is has got more more boxes in it, more steps, but it it is at its core, it is fundamentally a an instructional design model that follows very closely with the model presented in the course text. So here is a the representation of the model that is part of um, of the the Addy based course text model. And you'll notice on the left-hand side that assessing needs to identify the goals and constructing an analysis, part of that phase also includes something called analyze learners and contexts. Well, I, I add a, f a very important phase that addresses analyzing the context, but in a way that is different from what the course text offers. And so my model, as you can see, it does include all the main components that are part of the Addy model and part of the course text model. But you'll notice on the left-hand side of the model that I have um, a, a very separate um, step that addresses um, designing a, a particular learning context. Not the context of the learners, but the context of the learning. And that's, again, something that I'm gonna go into much more detail about as we progress through the class. But please note that I am still following a systematic design, mo instructional design model in what I'm going to be promoting in this course. Now, I wanna talk about the big picture of instructional design using a couple of examples that I'm sure you are probably very familiar with. And, and in, in the process of talking about these two sort of representative um, examples uh, of design, I want to, again, pay close, I want you to pay close attention to the role that, the, that some overall fundamental principles play in every aspect of, of design. So here you see a, a, a structure, a building structure on the left, a very distinct design on the left. And at some point in the development of that particular structure, designers had to, before they even, before they laid the foundation, before they put up the first um, framing beam or whatever, somebody sat down and sketched out a plan, a plan for building that particular structure, for creating that structure. And that plan at its heart was presumably based on sound architectural principles and engineering principles like 
what size beams should be used based on the size of the room and how, how far they should be spaced apart and, and other things like that. Also, things related to the, the choice of building materials. But all of those character or all those aspects of design are informed by the purpose of the structure in the first place. So if this was going to be a structure designed to accommodate s social meetings like a church house, then the structure that you see might, might not be adequate enough to meet those needs. Or if it was a dentist's office or being designed that way or being designed for a family of four versus a family, an extended family of 16, um, whatever, all the design that goes into this particular structure is grounded in the, in the purpose of the structure itself. And that, by the way, is, is why I think it's absolutely crucial that when you analyze an instructional experience, you focus on the purpose of the experience in great detail first, because it definitely it will impact every step of the design process. Now I'm going to give you another, another more distinct example that kind of shows you or, or, or represents for you some of the different characteristics of the design process in instructional design and some of the ways that you might consider um, how design thinking fits in to this process. And, it's, and, and the example I'm going to use is the example of, the, of planning a dinner party. And as you can see on the um, image on the left, I think those people must be having a, just a fabulous time because the food looks pretty good and they're wearing crowns. And so, you know, that's, you know, crowns. So when you're planning an event like a dinner party, so imagine imagine for a moment that you are planning a dinner party. Um, the decisions that you make about what it's going to be, what, what's going to happen in that dinner party, those decisions are going to be driven very much by the overall purpose of the dinner party. It might be a dinner party that's celebrating a particular holiday, in which case that might play into lots of the decisions you make regarding the planning of the dinner party. It might be be a party for somebody's birthday and that would go into that would ch it might change things it might be a dinner party where you're getting a lot of friends together so that they might just have a good time and maybe become better friends and you might be trying to establish a community of friends and that is a different kind of a dinner party than if it's a dinner party where you're entertaining business colleagues or 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 something like that. So the overall purpose of the dinner party is definitely going to inform all the decision making that happens when you go about planning this event. And so some of the things that you might be planning to make the dinner party a success would be first of all all the cooking concerns related to the to the dinner party. In my opinion, one of the most important aspects of the dinner party is what's going to be on the table. Um, you might also plan out what kind of music you want to be playing if that's your thing, if you, if you think that music is important and you want that as part of the dinner party. You might also actually structure conversation starters if the people at the party, if you think that they would need that in order to sort of break the ice and get, get talking as a group. You might have some games that you decide are going to be part of the dinner party experience. And I'm not sure if these crowns are any part of that or if they're part of a religious um, um, sort of celebration, I'm not sure. Um, or if they're celebrating something special um, in, someone's, in someone's life. But games might be appropriate. They might be playing a game right now. Um, and also seating arrangements might be something that you consider as uh, at the dinner party. You might consider it at that level. And again, the reason why you would be, um, or, or the reason why you might think seating arrangements are important would depend wholly on the overall purpose of the dinner party event. Now I want to take the cooking part of it because I want to go a little deeper on the on the planning and what kinds of decisions go into uh, or what kinds of factors go into deciding what you might actually prepare or cook for the dinner party. And so first of all you want to when you're when you're in the kitchen um, you, the, the things you need to consider might include things like, first of all, what's the purpose of the dish itself? Is it, is it for dinner? Is it lunch? Is it breakfast? Is it going to be dessert? So obviously the, the role of a particular dish um, is going to be part of the decision-making process. How many it should serve would be part of deci deciding what, how much of any particular ingredient you might need. 
um, what has worked before in terms of a dinner party. I, I don't know about you, but when I do have dinner parties, I'm always apprehensive trying new, trying out new things. I like to try out new recipes and new ideas, but when I'm having a dinner party, usually I like to, I like to, to prepare something that I've had a lot of success for in the past. I might also follow a recipe as I'm preparing my, my, my food because I often do that and it's part of what I regularly do. And I might select a recipe based on some ingredients that I already have, which again is something that I do regularly. That's part of my existing traditional approach. I might also select a recipe based on how much the ingredients are gonna cost. And again, that might be that factor might be more important de depending on how many people I'm planning to cook for. And other small things that might go into the decision-making process address um, any food allergies that might be present or, or other you know, um, dietary restrictions, how much time it would take to prepare and how much time I have to prepare it, how long it will keep if I, if I get to prepare it in advance and I have room in my refrigerator. So those kinds of nuts and bolts things are all part of the decision-making process that you would make only for only one part of the, of the dinner party and that's the part about the cooking. And as I mentioned earlier, sometimes the way that you go about doing this or what you default to are the results of your own previous experiences or what you have traditionally done um, when you're hosting um, other guests for, for, for dinner. And this is going to be very analogous to you thinking about, about developing a project where you're going to be solving an instructional solution your immediate reaction might be to go back to some of the ways that instruction has been done to you in your life or the way that you go about trying to already help people learn things. So those, that's just, this is all part of the design process. And, and as I mentioned before, if you look at all of these factors that just go into the cooking, many of these factors are dependent on, on, on the overall purpose of the dinner party in the first place. Now I want to talk about another factor. Again, it's just a small factor, but but take the seating arrangement factor. Uh, as I mentioned, that 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 might be something that you would plan in advance, and there might be some good reasons for doing that, and there might already be existing some some strategies for doing it well that you can call upon. And I have a short video here by Chowhound, one of my favorite culinary websites, where they do some recommendations about, about factors you should consider when planning a seating arrangement for a dinner party. Don't let your guests eat themselves. This is the opportunity to engineer a good time. Rule number one, cram them in. The smaller the table, the more cross-table conversation. Rule number two, separate couples. Couples drive over together and they go home together. Goodbye. Don't let them sit next to each other at dinner too. In addition, once separated, they're more likely to flirt. Sexual tension always improves a dinner party. Rule number three, mix and match. To encourage mingling, seat guests with a friend on one side and a stranger on the other. And don't invite people that need to be babysat. Can you call me a cab? Rule number four, play musical chairs. In between courses, the host should move around the table, sparking interaction. If you've done everything right, everybody will have a good time, but nobody will help with the cleanup. So that's a good, um, that is a good sort of representation of the fact that there, that, that there are strategies that, that somebody who is has a lot of experience um, with something like, for example, seating arrangements that they might recommend that you can learn from. Likewise, in instructional design, if you are trying to help somebody learn a particular type of skill, there are a list of, of, of well-researched strategies that you should draw upon in order to maximize the effectiveness of your instructional intervention. And that is something that you're gonna be learning a lot more about um, in this class. And, and by the way, I, I think that whole reference to um, flirting and sexual tension, that might be one of the reasons why um, sometimes my departmental dinner parties fall flat. It's, I've never considered, I've never considered those factors when um, inviting over work people. So who knows? 
Anyway, moving on. Here we have here 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 we have um, a picture up there on the screen. You probably can't read it too well, but let me just explain briefly. This is a diagram of something called a pacing guide, and if you are a teacher, you may be familiar with these. This is a resource that comes to um, that that comes with a lot of materials teachers, particularly those who teach in elementary education, get when they're, when they're as a support for planning the instruction on any given day or any given week or any given month. Now, the reason why I'm showing this and why I wanted to uh, represent some of these other resources that, that teachers have at their disposal, like, like text-based programs, like a reading program or a math program that aligns with particular outcomes, is that teachers um, don't teachers do do um, practice instructional design, but only in a very limited way. And hopefully, in this class, if you are a teacher or you are planning on teaching in the future, you will learn some valuable lessons about about the areas of instructional design that typical teachers don't actually um, typically address. Here's an. an uh, an, another resource is, is that some, some texts, some programs actually map out what you might actually do in a, um, in a particular chunk of time. And, and by mapping out, it's not, um, it's not providing a roadmap for the, an experience that the kids are going to have at a particular time in any detail, but the roadmap might be that they're going to be working on a particular section of, a, of an existing course resource during the first week of class and during, for a particular subject area, and then during the next week they might have, you know, worksheet number 13B and, um, and, and, and that. Th that is a very different practice than instructional design. So let me just explain that in a little bit more detail because this addresses how instructional design is, is different from teaching um, or, or from educational practice in a more traditional sense. Again, here I have the, the basic diagram for, of instructional design that the course text promotes, the ADDIE model. And generally speaking, teachers tend to focus on the analysis phase where a, a typical classroom teacher would learn more about their students, about what their students are, um, where they are at skill-wise coming into a particular class. They, they might analyze that. They might analyze learners based on their own um, particular um, preferences as far as l learning situations go. But that is the level of analysis. It's not an analysis to determine what order would be the best way to teach a, a set of math skills, for example. It's an analysis of where students might be in, in relation to an existing math program in the first place. And then teachers focus a lot of their design efforts on how they're actually going to be implementing material that has already been designed and already been developed. So those two phases of the design process are not necessarily part of the day-to-day -day activity of a typical classroom teacher. And, um, and finally, there's an evaluation phase, but usually the evaluation phase focuses on improving the implementation phase of instruction and not so much evaluating either the value, success, or actual design of the resources themselves. And again, I'm not, I, I don't wanna speak for all teachers, but I'm just gonna suggest that these are the areas of traditional instructional design that practicing educators get a get a get get training in, get a background in, and focus most of their attention on. And so, if you are a classroom teacher, you need to recognize that you're going to be asked to do some things in the design and development phase that you might be a little bit that might be unfamiliar to you as. And if you're not a classroom teacher, you you are, but you in this case are being asked to. Um, to develop an instructional experience for a classroom teacher, you are, um, again, you, you need to understand that you are going to be spending a great deal of your creative efforts in the design and development phase, which is something that a typical educator spends less time on um, than other phases of the design process. And finally,
Finally, in this introduction, I just want to review with you what characteristics or what aspects of the course text are going to be we're going to be focusing on throughout the coming throughout the coming weeks of of the class. And so, first of all, here at the beginning of class, I'm going to have you read the introduction to instructional design chapter so that you get a big a better understanding, a deeper understanding of what the components of this particular instructional design model model are. And so you'll read through that whole chapter. You will in chapter two, I have a different color check mark there because you will you will only be focusing on some specific aspects of identifying the instructional design goals, uh, the goals of the instruction. Um, the chapter two actually has a lot more, goes into a lot more depth on some practices that you are not going to be, uh, you don't need to worry about because I'm actually going to be giving you um, a lot of the instructional goal um, sort of, I'll give you that framework first as your, as your client. And so, uh, and so we're only going to be using parts of chapter two. We'll be definitely using all of chapter three, the skill involved in analyzing a goal to figure out what does somebody need to learn specifically in order to accomplish that goal. So that's a great chapter for that. We'll be examining part of chapter four where you examine how to determine what the subordinate goals are and the entry skills for a particular learning experience. We're not going, we're actually skipping chapter five because I have a whole different approach to context that is not addressed, addressed in the course text at all, but it is in the notes in great detail. Uh, chapter six is a very important chapter, whether you're an, a t practicing teacher or not. Writing performance objectives is, a, is one of the most valuable skills in the instructional design process. And that's something that you need to learn how to do well in this class. And so chapter six is a very important chapter. Chapter seven, I have my own notes in developing assessment instruments that go, that, that go in, in a lot more detail than what's presented in chapter seven. So we will likely skip chapter seven um, and uh, except for some of the basic um, concepts that are presented there. Um, same with chapter eight. I have more detail about planning instructional strategies than are in chapter eight. I have those in the notes, although chapter eight does have some really good examples that I'm gonna be taking advantage of. Um, we'll skip from chapter eight to chapter 11, which has to do with conducting formative evaluations. That is really important. And you're gonna learn more about that in subsequent um, course presentations. Um, but everything in between chapter eight and chapter 11 is going to be addressed more by me in my lectures and notes and by your experiences with the course project. And that will do it as far as the actual material straight out of the text. So please understand that we are not going to be addressing some of the chapters in the course text at all. And some of the chapters we will be addressing only parts of them. I will also be using the appendices as um, as I will reference those regularly to provide you with some clear examples of some of the specific components that you're going to be learning more about in the instructional design process. So if you take a look at this, that this map, this map of the table of contents shows you how you're going to be using the course text really in a very broad sense. And all of this will apply to you learning the skills I think you need to learn in order to um, have a really good handle on the instructional design process and in that process, have a much better understanding of how design thinking is actually applied in, in a particular um, um, content area or a particular domain, in this case, the domain of instruction of, or of trying to help people learn things. And one last thing that I wanna point, point out to you is that even if you are not going to ever be a teacher, whether in grade school, high school, or college, if you plan on going into a line of work that that is not related to instruction at all, I will just I, I will just tell you right now the principles you're going to learn about how people learn and what you can do to help people learn. Those principles, which are part and parcel of the systematic instructional design process, are valuable to to any aspect of your life in which you are asked to help people learn things, and that includes being a really good partner to somebody. That includes being an effective parent, and that certainly includes in a job situation, 
how uh, how to help other people learn things um, as part of your job. And rarely will you be in a profession where you are not asked at some point in your practice to help somebody else learn something related to what it is uh, you are doing. So that's it. It's a very, very valuable course, and I look forward to getting this thing going.